In this presentation, I'll talk to you about how the canary in the coal mine got its reputation as a protective species for people, but we'll talk on a larger scale about diagnosing and avoiding poisoning of ecosystems, animals, and people. Now, this is a big challenge in today's world. Canaries are active pets and they sing a lot. In the coal mine, miners would often experience asphyxiation, sometimes explosions, and certainly toxic gases, and many deaths resulted from that. Birds are built differently. Their physiology is quite different in their respiratory systems. They have bidirectional airflow through the trachea like mammals do, but largely unidirectional airflow through the lungs. And they have a very thin blood gas barrier. So they experience asphyxiation and toxicity from airborne substances far faster than mammals do. Uh, at the bottom, there's a link that you may want to jot down to a website on bird respiration. It has all kinds of images. Evolutionary aspects are considered uh, there. It's really helpful to understand these marked differences, how important they are in uh, toxicology as well. So in mines, as recently as 1986, canaries were still used uh, to warn mainly of methane that was coming out of coal deposits, which causes asphyxiation. In other words, not enough oxygen. And of course, it's explosive as well. If there's a spark, uh, there, it could be devastating. Uh, and in addition to methane seeping out of the coal itself, uh, carbon monoxide from engines used in the mines was a problem as well. Of course, carbon monoxide alters hemoglobin, so it cannot carry oxygen. It cannot release oxygen well in the tissues. Um, people die from carbon monoxide poisoning in all kinds of places, but it was a huge issue in mines. So keep in mind that these birds, these canaries, were real. Uh, their effects were very rapid, and the miners valued them and they wanted to protect them, and they would grab the canary if it stopped singing or if it fell to the bottom of the cage and run for the surface. So they are very appreciated. They would try to use them over again if, whenever possible. Today in homes, people rely on methane in natural gas, sometimes propane, very similar. Uh, and of course, there are leaks sometimes, and, and these leaks can kill the family and kill other pets. The birds, though, they react fastest. Uh, sometimes people will be wise enough to put a uh, gas detector close to their birds because they want to protect the birds. And if it goes off, it might go off in time to get the bird out of the way and, and also get out of there for, uh, to protect themselves as well. Um, in homes, when people use space heaters or just normal furnaces, any sort of fossil fuel, coal, oil, natural gas, meth, uh, propane, uh, or if they have an engine in a garage or a grill somewhere that's not vented uh, well, uh, space heaters, boy, things can turn bad in a hurry because of carbon monoxide poisoning. So the birds in the home are often affected as, uh, before any other species, including people. Um, Birds will also be affected by other airborne toxicants, and they may die from burnt foods, uh, from overheated cooking oils, uh, from self-cleaning ovens, from overheated Teflon and Silverstone, these slippery coatings that were used a great deal, especially on drip pans. They may be affected by secondhand tobacco smoke. They can be poisoned by ammonia, aerosols, many different kinds has ca have caused problems in birds as well. So we'll talk about who has the fun. We'll talk about one toxicology. Uh, we'll get into an example of industrial pollution, a couple of them, including the association with cancer. Uh, we'll touch on petroleum and other compounds in the environment related to petroleum spills. We'll hit insecticides, uh, some of the examples, and 
we'll get into cyanobacterial, or in other words, blue-green algal toxins at the end. So here we go. Toxicologists have a lot of fun, and fun in the sense of gratification through our work, because we help establish diagnoses in a timely way. We help apply effective treatments. We help restrict or even ban toxic chemicals. We help trigger cleanups of contaminated sites, and we help find alternatives, either safer chemicals or non-chemical means to meet human needs. Ultimately, we protect humans, domestic animals, wildlife, including endangered species. We can actually help protect billions of animals uh, through this kind of work. This one toxicology idea is just shorthand for the idea that we're all in this together. Uh, this slide shows not only a thyroid adenoma in a cat and a young mother carefully examining her baby girl, but also some killer whales. It turns out that the cat in the home and the killer whales were both exposed to flame retardants, which are important household and environmental contaminants. Basically, if we were protecting that cat, if we were protecting those killer whales, uh, we'd also be protecting people as well from flame retardants. We haven't done so well. Uh, we're starting to get a hold of a handle on, on those things and bringing them under control, and, but we can do better. That's the idea behind one toxicology. So here we have uh, an expert veterinary ophthalmologist examining a dog in a clinic and a, an expert marine mammal veterinarian studying a dolphin in the field uh, in a study where they would capture the dolphins and take samples and get diagnoses and certainly release the animals back to the wild to resume their lives. In these instances and in many others, uh, people are also exposed and people are poisoned. They may be in closer proximity to some of these contaminants than the animals. We're all in this together, and if we were protecting people, uh, we could also be protecting these domestic animals and these wild species as well. The Lancet formed an expert panel on pollution and human health, and they reported that pollution is linked to about one in six human deaths globally, that it, these deaths total three times as many as those caused by AIDS, TB, and malaria together. Um, but even that high number of deaths caused by pollution was an underestimate because they examined only a minor group of pollutants, a handful of pollutants where they had really good data. Uh, and it did not include uh, deaths in utero. Of course, not every adverse effect of pollutants is a lethal one. There are other effects, endocrine disruption, neurologic damage, immunologic problems, and obesity as well. So this just is a underrepresentation, really, of the problems that are out there affecting people in today's world. In the developed world, we have effective pollution prevention, pollution detection, pollution cleanup equipment. Uh, we know how to prevent a good many contamination problems, but we don't do enough to help developing nations. And in developing nations, mining and industry, agricultural pesticides, nutrients, uh, the controls are just totally inadequate in many places, and the impacts on the people and the ecosystems. The additions of things like mercury to the global ecosystem, uh, they're really severe. So we have a lot of outreach that we need to get done. Uh, a lot more collaboration, a lot more education, uh, a lot more taking our foot that's nailed to the floor loose and getting involved on a global basis if we're going to make a real adequate difference. The impacts of toxic chemicals depend, of course, on the genomes and the associated receptors and metabolism and physiology of animals, but also on how they live, their diets, their locations, and the choices that people have made that determine their exposures. Uh, all animals, including humans, are exposed to chemicals in their water, in their food, and in their air. Uh, the domestic pet animals, uh, 
and domestic livestock, uh, we know where they've been generally, and they tend to have more constant diets. Pet animals have dog food or cat food or some other prepared diet as a rule. Farm animals have diets that are formulated to meet their needs. So chemical exposures can come from those diets. They can, for pets, they also come from homes and yards. Uh, and of course, they have short lifespans compared to people, but we don't examine enough of them at post-mortem, and so we don't find lesions, and we don't correlate lesions with contaminants the way we should. And so those data are lost. Uh, they could be collected, though, and they should be collected far more than they are at present. Now, farm animals, uh, they get exposed from the pastures, from the farm buildings, from the water sources, whether it's the well or the surface water. Uh, the meat-producing animals are typically slaughtered at an early age, and they're inspected, and tissues are, can be collected not only for microbial diseases, but also for toxic problems as well. And the dairy and the breeding animals, they're not so old. They're starting to have their reproduction wane when they go to slaughter. And they too get inspected and they are a source and can be a, a more often used source of uh, toxicological specimens for analysis. Wildlife are really diverse in their form and their function and their habitats and their exposures. Game species like fish, birds, and mammals are inspected by fishermen and hunters and sometimes check stations where veterinary pathologists uh, may be found uh, and other wildlife health specialists. Uh, wildlife veterinarians not only do that sort of work, they also develop uh, field research studies and they will even examine roadkill. So they they work hard to figure out what's going on with wild populations and how they can be protected. Of course, some species are terrestrial, some fly, some are aquatic, some are amphibious. Mice, they really tend to have a small range, maybe only 40 meters in radius. On the other hand, Arctic terns and Swainson's hawks migrate more than 20,000 miles each year. And think about the food web. There are lots of planktivores, there are lots of herbivores, and there are many predators, and then there are some top predators. And if you're talking about a biomagnified contaminant, something that's fat soluble and hard to metabolize, uh, the top predators will often have by far the highest residues and therefore the highest likelihood of adverse impacts. And then you think about the lifespan. We touched on this a bit before, but Daphnia may live five to six months. Turkey vultures, 16 years. Bowhead whales, up to over 200 years. So they will integrate their lifetime, they will integrate their habitat, they will integrate what contaminants are there and to which they're exposed. Now we have to think about whether with equivalent exposures, who's the most sensitive? And a lot of times animals with equivalent exposures are more sensitive to, than people Sometimes they're less sensitive than people. Many times we just don't know. Uh, to learn enough to protect animals and people all at the same time, what we have to do is we have to examine their environments and the animals. And we should be looking at those that are alive and those that die, just as we would do with human beings or dogs or other domestic animals. We, it's, it's a challenge. We'd like to be able to do physical exams, collect blood and urine, uh, we'd like to do post-mortem exams and histopathology. We'd like to have specimens of air, water, sediment for aquatic animals, soils, and other biota, uh, plants, oftentimes, because they're the diet or the base of the food web. And uh, we need to get these specimens from the animals and their environments and collect them, package them, label and ship them, uh, for microbiology and also for analytical toxicology. Knowing how to do this really helps to get a diagnosis. In addition to the diagnostic work when you have an incident, a lot of times research is necessary to really confirm causation, to understand the mechanisms, to get detail on the nature of the pathophysiologic impacts and the lesions, to establish diagnostic criteria, and to set the stage for effective therapies when therapy is possible. 
So this may involve studies of the free-ranging species that's impacted in the field. Uh, other times it will involve laboratory work where you might be able to sort out some of the questions with cultured tissues or, or cells. A lot of times you would use a related species as a surrogate. Uh, or maybe if the species that's impacted in the wild is numerous and if it's amenable to life and captivity, uh, you might be able to study it directly as well. Perhaps, uh, for example, a bird in a large aviary. Uh, oftentimes you go back and forth from the lab to the field, to the lab, to the field, to build up information that is strong enough that you can take responsible action to prevent a problem in the future.